Good afternoon. Welcome to the first ever Strategic Equity Management Market and Economic Update presentation. The topic today is what is happening with the economy and the market and what does that mean for you and your portfolio. Before we get into the details, just a couple housekeeping items. First off, uh, everything you hear today is not intended to be investment advice. It is for informational purposes only. We always recommend that you discuss anything you hear and any ideas you might have with a financial professional. Furthermore, our Form ADV Part 2, which is our disclaimer document, is available on our website at www.stratequity.com. It is also available by calling our office at 1-800-408-2423. If you do hear any performance information listed in here, one thing we want you to understand is past performance is not a guarantee of future results. We also try to make sure to frame everything in the right context. Again, if you have any questions regarding performance or our services, please refer to our form ADV Part 2. A little bit of background on strategic equity management. We were founded in 1992 by an, elect an engineer named Rick Gage. We're SEC registered and we have a focus on active risk management. To learn more about our background and how our company was formed, we again would like to direct you to our website. That's www.strategequity.com. Our company does consist of nine employees. Um, again, Rick Gage is the president and senior portfolio manager. In 1998, Steve Goad and myself, Jeff Hyback, joined Strategic Equity. So our portfolio management team has been in place for the last 13 years. We also have a very strong team dedicated to serving our clients, and we are very proud of them. And, and hopefully everybody is pleased with the service they've gotten from us. And as always, if, if you're haven't had a good experience, please feel free to contact us. But the topic of the day, really the topic of the month, topic of the summer is how in the world did we get here? We've put a, up a lot of pictures there on the screen of some of the things we're, we're dealing with and it, it really started back in 2008 with the financial crisis and we, we did have a bit of a rally in 2009 and parts of 2010, but there's just a lot of angst out there. Um, people really aren't feeling comfortable. And so we thought we would address how did we get to the place we're at right now? Most recently, the topic has been Europe and everybody is focused on Europe. And, and one thing that I, I found this chart the other day was that we've really been dealing with this since 2010. Everybody probably remembers the flash crash from last May and it really started in the midst of the first Greek credit crisis. And at, since then, the European Central Bank has been trying to step in and buy bonds in order to help um, change the outcome of, of their situation. And really, it all boils down to the fact that Europe has a debt problem. They, they've used debt for too long to try to stimulate their economy. And... Now their solution is to try to bail themselves out by taking on more debt. And as you can see, if you look at that blue shaded area on the, the chart here, it has gone up almost exponentially this year. And we keep hearing about new solutions being offered, and it might last for a week to two weeks, and then all of a sudden we hear about more problems in Europe. And until they finally address the actual debt problems, we're probably going to keep having issues with this. But you might ask, what does this have to do with our investments here in the United States? And it's really important to understand the reason this is an issue for Wall Street is all of the banks in Europe have become intermingled. Because of the European Union, they've been able to invest and lend money to all the other countries inside their union. And what that's done is a French bank might own a whole bunch of Greek debt and the Greek debt might owe money to the French banks and everybody's so intermingled and really for the last year and a half we've only been dealing with Greece and if you could see on the chart there Greece and the, their level of debt compared to everybody else is re really small especially when you start looking in Italy so one problem inside of one country filters through to the banks of the other countries but the real issue 
for us in the United States is that our banks have turned around and made the same mistakes they made in 2008, which is they've been lending money to those European banks and the European governments. Now this table here, you don't need to understand all the numbers on there, but the one thing I point out when I look at that, the, the very bottom there where it says US, you have direct exposure, default insurance sold, which is indirect exposure, and then you see that total exposure. So just to Greece, our Wall Street banks have $41 billion worth of exposure. And if you see that default insurance sold, that is the same type of instrument that got the Wall Street banks in trouble back in 2008 when they were issuing insurance on, against the default of credit defaults, um, mortgage-backed securities, excuse me. And they were trying to basically make fees off of that, thinking that a default would never happen. Well, as we know, a default did happen, and they had to be bailed out by the taxpayers. And so you can see Wall Street banks at the beginning of the year had $41 billion of exposure to Greece, $105 billion to Ireland, and another $46 billion to Portugal. So because we bailed them out, it seems like they haven't learned from their mistakes. And whenever you hear about Europe and, and you wonder why it's moving the stock market, just think of the insurance because we know some Wall Street banks have insured against a collapse over in Europe. We just don't know by how much and who's going to be on the hook for that. Moving on, the real issue though, again, this has been going on since 2008, is the housing bubble. And I've seen a lot of fingers be pointed at, at the others and I wanted to, to set things straight because we have to understand we all got into this mess together. It wasn't one single firm, it wasn't one single banker, it was a long list of things that happened. As you can see there, the Republican-led Congress repealed Glass-Steagall in 1999. Now what Glass-Steagall was, was something that was put back during in place during the Depression that basically was designed to prevent a, a big economic collapse. And I like to think of it as there there was a dividing line between a commercial bank and an investment bank. A commercial bank is supposed to lend money and, and make loans to try to help businesses and, and people buy houses and things like that, whereas an investment bank is more designed to do what it says, which is to make investments in companies. Well, Glass-Steagall was repealed by that Republican-led Congress in ninety nine. President Clinton, of course a Democrat, signed that legislation. So when somebody wants to blame the other side for this issue, we, we have to remember both sides were all for repealing those things. And if you look back at it, if we had never allowed commercial banks to become investment banks, we wouldn't have had commercial banks invested in some of the, these instruments that led to them needing bailed out. But that doesn't mean everybody else is off the hook. The Federal Reserve is supposed to supervise everybody, all, all the banks out there, and they failed dramatically to do anything about it. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner actually was the president of the New York Fed at the time, and you know, being you know the way our, our country is going, rather than punishing him for failing to supervise these banks, we instead gave him a promotion and made him Treasury Secretary. The Wall Street banks and insurance companies also were to blame for the housing bubble because they not only packaged up the mortgages as quickly as possible and sold them, they turned around and invested in these mortgages and offered insurance against them, just like we mentioned when we were talking about Europe. The ratings agencies, they were pressured by these Wall Street banks to start putting ratings on these new securities of, of bundled mortgages, and they really just didn't understand. Their expertise had been evaluating corporate debt and sovereign country debt, but never these complex products, and they their actuaries screwed up. They rated them AAA, everybody believed it, and they never dug any deeper to figure out what was behind those ratings. And finally, the pension funds, mutual funds, and other big institutional investors all poured money into these risk-free investments. They didn't understand them, they just thought, hey, it's AAA, it's paying me 4 or 5% interest. I'm going to jump in and do it. And it's, so again, you could see the long list of people that were to blame for the housing bubble. But one thing that I, I noticed back in August was that 
everybody decided to gang up on one party. And that came at the beginning of August when Standard & Poor's decided to downgrade America's debt. And the first thing everybody said was, well, Standard & Poor's was to blame for the housing bubble because they had a AAA rating on some of these mortgage-backed securities. Well, number one, as you can see, it really wasn't just Standard & Poor's that did this. It was a whole long list of people. But also, there was a strong reason behind the, the downgrade of America. And just because they made one mistake in the past shouldn't make us not listen to them. Because there, there's a very complex reason that we, we had to see America downgraded, and that's we're spending too much money. Let's look at this deal that Congress made at the beginning of August. They agreed to cut spending by about $2.2 .2 trillion. Just looking at that, say they are able to actually come up with those spending cuts. I don't think they will be, but let's just pretend they can. If you average that out over the next 10 years, the debt's going to grow by $5.5 .5 trillion in 10 years. Now remember, our total debt when they were arguing over the debt ceiling was $14 trillion. So this is a 40% increase in the level of debt we hold right now. And to put that $5 trillion even in bigger perspective, if you go back to 2000, our total national debt was under $5 trillion. So this is the big reason that Standard & Poor's decided, hey, even though you guys made this agreement to cut spending, it was not enough. Because you could see what that's going to do to our national debt. Another thing Standard & Poor's pointed out was that the growth assumptions that are used in those budget cuts and the deficit numbers that we see are entirely too optimistic. They're assuming between a 25 and 3% growth rate in the economy. And one thing I, I like to point out is this red line here on the GDP um, chart shows that for the most part our economy since 2000 has been unable to grow very many quarters above that rate. So now when we look at these deficit numbers, we're supposed to assume that magically the economy is going to be able to grow above that red line. Now you consider all the stimulus that was thrown at the economy since 2008, and then you realize that only three of the last eight quarters have been above that line. You start to see why we have some real issues here. Now one thing you can also see from that graph is that that dashed blue line is the actual linear trend in our economic growth. And as you can see, the trend now is below 2% growth. So if the economy is unable to grow at that 25 to 3% level, the deficits are going to be even bigger. And that's one thing Standard & Poor's was pointing out. They also pointed out that inside of the, the CBO's estimates, they assume there will not be a recession over the next 10 years. Now, I would like to hope that that could happen, but as we know, even in the 1990s, we saw a little bit of a recession at the beginning. So in, it seems like the, these estimates that they're using for, to come up with the budget deficit cuts are just way too optimistic, and we probably won't come anywhere near the number that they're, they're predicting. But the real problem that Standard & Poor's pointed out when they downgraded America is that nobody wants to address the real problems in our economy. You can see from this chart, the bar on the left is the U.S. national debt. Right next to that is a total amount of Social Security debt that's not on our balance sheet, but that's what we've promised out. And then you can see as we move along, Medicare Part D is quite a bit higher at $20 trillion. But then you look at just good old Medicare, and it's almost $80 trillion in cost that that we've promised we would cover. And you could set that next to the U.S. economy there on the right, and you could see, unless we address these things, America is going to run into its own debt problems. And that's what Standard & Poor's was pointing out. They highlighted some of the things that, that show that Social Security is not sustainable. If you look at this chart on the top, you can see that Social Security payments as a percentage of GDP are projected to rise all the way past 6% of our total economy um, uh, up until 2032 when they expect that the population will finally catch up. 
with that. And as you can see, back in 1962, it was about 2.5% of our economy going out to Social Security. A bigger problem is the percentage of Americans, Americans receiving Social Security. You could see it was a pretty flat line between 18 and 20% for the better part of 40 years. And now we're starting to see that it's probably going to climb close to 40% over the next 60, 70 years where we have almost as many people working as we do collecting Social Security. So that's something that has not been addressed and, and one reason Standard & Poor's said we cannot keep a AAA rating on the United States. Here's another way of looking at the workers that are receiving Social Security versus the workers paying for them. You could see back in 1955 we had almost nine workers for every recipient of Social Security. And as you look now, we're, we're down to about three workers for every re recipient. And that's projected to fall below two by the time we get into the 2080s. And you can see even real quickly by 2032, we're almost to a two to one margin. And so if you think about it, because the Social Security Trust Fund has been um, drained by, by all of the spending the last 30 years, you would have to have on paper, if we don't cut benefits, a 50% payroll tax by 2032 just to cover the benefits that we've promised. And obviously you can't tax people at a 50% rate and have them have anything good happen in our economy. It would be devastating to our economy. So it has to be fixed. And the reason it needs to be fixed immediately and, and have this problem solved is you can see this chart shows the impact Social Security has had on the United States deficit. And what it means is, if you think about it, it was almost like a piggy bank where we would withhold money from people's paychecks for Social Security. They would put it in the piggy bank, and then the Treasury Department would come over and say, hey, we, we need to take this money from here to help our spending so we don't have to borrow as much. So they would put an IOU in the pig, piggy bank. Well, now that it's time to crack open that piggy bank, they're opening it up and seeing there's no money left. It's all IOUs. And so now we're to the point where every year we're going to have to raise more money to cover all the money that's already been spent. I point out to people that it's unfortunate, but we've already received a lot of our Social Security money back. They'll say, well, I paid into it. I should get it back out. Well, because we elected the people we did over the last 30 years, we have already received those benefits in the forms of abnormally low unemployment. So if you had a job, you you benefited from 5% unemployment for almost 10 years. Uh, we saw a big boost in personal income in the 1980s and 1990s. The, the road systems were improved. We, we saw so much spending happening that that was what our Social Security money was being spent on, not on our retirements. And now that everybody's starting to retire in the baby boom generation, they're saying, wait a minute, where's my retirement money? And so that's why this is an issue we have to address. And that's the primary reason Social Security um, caused the downgrade to the United States. Now moving on, the big issue we're starting to see is people asking us, first of all, how are how are they saying we're going back in a recession when I don't even feel like we've gotten out of a recession? And trust me, I, I understand where that's coming from. But on paper, the, the recession did end in July 2009. We showed the chart earlier of the economy growing. However, it's been a very sluggish recovery. And this chart here shows why most of us feel like the recession never ended. And what it does is it plots going back to 1947, the the best um, economic recovery, the worst economic recovery, which is the bottom line, and then the average economic recovery. And you could see that red line is tracking almost the worst recovery on record. That's why we feel like the recession didn't end, and it's because we didn't. So let's look at why we feel that way. First of all, we've relied on borrow and spend policies for 30 years. This chart here, there's a lot of lines on there, but the one I want you to focus in on is that red line. That's the level of public debt. That's our national debt. 
And then follow that red line along with the green line, which is marred inside some of those other lines near the bottom. That green line is the economic growth. And you could see that we use just an amazing amount of debt in order to try to finance our growth. And really the only thing that kept up with the level of public debt that we were taking on was the stock market and the level of household debt. Now you could see the level of household debt has started to level off and everything else n never even kept up. So these borrow and spend policies are no longer working to support our economy. And so now we have to figure out a, a different way to grow than just using debt. Another thing to consider is you probably hear a lot of people saying, well, we need the government to spend money in order to stimulate the economy. Now, that may have been true, and it, it did work pretty well since the, the late 1930s. However, the, the thing that people have, have always said is that th when we spend money via the government, it multiplies into more money. So this chart here shows that money multiplier, and you have the ratio of, of what one dollar turns into that's put into the economy. And as you can see, in 1987-88, it peaked at about three dollars and twenty-five cents. So every dollar put into the economy was turned into three three dollars and twenty-five cents. And the reason that would work is we would say hire a construction company to work on a bridge. That construction company then would, of course, hire workers to help them build this bridge. Those workers would take their money and they would go spend it. They'd buy clothes and foods and everything else. And then, so from the stores they bought it from, they would have workers. So they had this model that says, okay, one dollar was actually turning in three dollars and twenty-five cents. Now the problem we're seeing is when you get this this new government contract. Yes, they'll pay their workers. However, the workers are really taking the the money in two places. They're taking it to Walmart, which turns around and buys all of their stuff from China and other foreign companies, so the money then leaves our country, or they're taking it to the bank. They're either paying down all that debt that we showed on the prior slide, or they're just hoarding it. So now we can see that one dollar put into the economy turns into 73 cents. So this thing they used to call the money multiplier is now actually a divisor. So when somebody says we need to spend more money to stimulate the economy, they're basically saying I want to throw away 28 cents of every dollar we spend of your children's money because it is not working. We are sending too much money overseas. We have too much debt that people have to pay down. So just this, this idea that we need to keep stimulating the economy is preposterous and it, it's something that really needs to stop if we're ever going to want to get back on our feet to a, a strong economy. Another issue that we're seeing is that the money is staying on Wall Street. It's it's not coming back out. It is going from the Federal Reserve's balance sheet into the banks and they're turning around and putting it in the savings account. This chart here shows what the banks have done. The blue line is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, and you can see the different QEs, which stands for quantitative easing, which really stands for money printing. And then I want you to look at the red line, which shows the reserve balances. And if you really focus in on, say, quantitative easing 2, and that duration that, that went from November 2010 until June of this year, you can see that it pretty much tracked line for line what the Federal Reserve was doing. So they printed money and they turned around and the banks just deposited it. So it's not getting off of the balance sheets. And until that happens, we're not going to see any real improvement in our economy. We gotta get you could see it's one point eight trillion dollars sitting there on deposit at the Federal Reserve. That's money that could be sent into the economy with different policies. Now moving on question we are also asked is this a bull market or a bear market if you turn on the television they're probably saying this is a bull market this is just a correction that we've seen in the, in the summer and into September and this is a buying opportunity that they're telling us a lot 
one way we look at whether it's a bull or a bear market is to just slap on a 200-day moving average. And the reason we like to do that is because that's the general direction of the market on average over the past year. And one simple definition is if the market's below that 200-day moving average, you should consider it a bear market, which means you're probably not going to want to get excited if, if, say, you're a long-term buy-and-hold investor about jumping back in and putting money to work in the market if it's below that 200-day moving average. Another thing to look at that I really think makes the case for whether it's a bull or a bear market is this chart here that shows the days that have had a 4% or greater decline in the stock market. And one thing you can see is that from 2000 to 2000 to 2002, we had four 4% 4 declines in the market. And then as you can see, as we got into the bull market that began in 2003, we didn't have a single day where the market lost more than 4%. Then we jumped to 2008, 2009, and at the very beginning, we didn't see any 4% losses. But as things accelerated, you could see we had 21 4% declines. And again, you could see after the market bottomed and we finally felt like we were in a bull market, we didn't see another 4% decline again. Now, if we look at 2011, we already have four 4% declines in the market. Four of them already this year. And you could see if you look at that, the way the market has dropped now versus how it did in the summer of 2008, there's a lot of eerie parallels. So I just caution people that they might be telling you it's a bull market on TV, but they always tell you it's a bull market. They want you to stay invested. They, they don't want you to think for yourself and put money on the sidelines and just wait things out. You know, sometimes there, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, this is too hard. I'm going to sit it out until it gets a little bit easier. Either way, whether it's a bull market or a bear market, I, I point out to people, this is not a healthy stock market. This chart here, again, goes back and looks at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And we look at quantitative easing one, which is the first time the Fed started printing money. And then we look at what happened to the market when the Fed wasn't printing money. And you can see that red line, the market really struggled until the Fed announced last August that quantitative easing two was around the, com around the corner. And then the market took off. Well, now that we've seen quantitative easing two end, look what's happened to the stock market. So we've had a market that since 2009 has been supported by the Federal Reserve printing money, which that may be nice over the short run, but it really does not help get us out of this, the problems that we have. And the problems we have are too much debt. It's very simple. We have too much debt. And what the Fed is doing is they're adding more debt to try and fight the problem. So again, whether it's a bull or a bear market, it's not a healthy market. We'll get there. I, I, I fully believe we will get through these problems, but we're not going to get through these problems until we admit we have a problem and that adding more debt is not the solution we need. So as you can see, all of these things are really starting to impact America. We have seen things like consumer sentiment is plummeting. We're, we're going back to levels that besides the financial crisis we haven't seen you know, since the 80s on some of these indicators. Housing permits are, are just, they're sitting at, at 50 year lows. People are unable to sell their houses. You see food stamp participation just climbing and you know, at the time where Wall Street bonuses are hitting record highs. And then finally, you have real personal income that hasn't come anywhere near keeping up with what's happening in the economy. It's, it's, people are making less money because we've seen inflation. We've seen housing continue to struggle. And we just have this anger brewing in America. And it's something that has to be overcome. It's, it's going to have a big impact on our market. But the angrier people get, the sooner we'll be at fixing the problems, which is quit giving money to Wall Street. Quit spending our children's money on, on projects that aren't putting money back into the economy. We, we just got to stop. And 
So you might look at the, the these charts and say, well, that's a bad thing, and it is over the short run, but it, it's a good thing because we're going to be getting to a point where we can start rebuilding America. So you might look at this chart here. This is something that looks at the cycles the market has gone through and say, why does it say there's a reason for long-term optimism? And looking at the things we're facing, you, I could see why you would say that. But one thing that I like to point out is these 18-year cycles are based on demographics. They're based on the, the size of a generation and, and how long they have an influence on the economy. And if you want to really understand things, just look at that green period from 1983 to 2000. That was when the baby boom generation was at their peak earnings cycle. And they obviously stimulated the economy a lot. It helped the stock market. But they also added a lot of debt. Now that they're starting to retire, we have to start paying for some of those things, as well as dealing with them pulling money out of the stock market. So we probably could have seven more lean years of, of problems. But even if we do, even if from today till 2018 the market ends up at the same spot, you can see there's room for opportunities if you look back at the 65 to 82 period, again at the 29 to 46 period. There's lots of places where there's big leaps in the market. But once we get through this, and I, I think we will get through it, we're going to have such tremendous potential. But the key is hanging on to your money, to not losing 50% of the value like we've seen happen twice since 2000. That's the goal. That's the whole point of this chart is we will get through this. We have all along. If you go back to thinking, think after the Civil War, how, how dire things would have looked. Or think back to December 8th, 1941, how bad things would have felt back then. We got through it. In fact, starting 1947, we had almost a 400% rise in the market over 18 years. So we will get through it, but you got to hang on to your money. You, you can't just let it ride up and down with these waves or you're going to end up behind the curve. And the other thing you have to realize that America is still the greatest country in the world. There's so many great technological inventions that are coming out of America. They might be manufactured in China, but I, I also believe over the next seven years, a lot of that's going to be coming back. And you have to realize those profits go back to those United States corporations. They go back to hiring engineers and, and software designers and, and everything else here in the United States. And we truly believe that once we get through some of these other issues overseas, we're going to see that money come back. And, and we're going to see opportunities on the other side of this. So we don't want you to lose hope and think, well, all Strategic ever talks about is the downside. That's not true. We we believe that once we're through it, things are going to be looking pretty dang good for America because we still are the strongest country in the world. Now, how would we address some of these issues we've talked about today? The way we do it is we use our four investment programs and we look at this investment pyramid and you know, kind of took the idea off the food pyramid of you know, how do you want to structure your portfolio? What's the best way to have a healthy retirement? And what we do is we just want to fill down from the very top. And we want to make sure a client's taking care of their money markets, their CDs, you know, things like that that have a very short-term time horizon or something where somebody just doesn't want to lose any money on. But after you've filled in that need, we want to start looking at our other programs like Income Allocator, Absolute Return, Enhanced Portfolio, and then finally, Enhanced Growth Allocator. You might also notice on there that we include the S&P 500 Index, and we think that for some people, for some portions of their money, just a buy and hold S&P 500 type holding is pretty good, but you've got to take care of all the things up above that. Because somebody that, that's 80 years old probably doesn't have much business at all having the S&P 500 in their portfolio unless it's money that they don't intend to ever spend and they just want to let it ride and do whatever. So we just want to fill down from the top and then see what's there when it, when it's all said and done. And if you still have money left over for buy and hold, that's great. Because over the very long term, as we showed in that 18-year chart, 
the market should come out ahead um, over the very long. How we're invested currently, you could see we're in what's called a bearish position. If you look at that yellow line of our net equity exposure, we have no equity exposure, of course, in income allocator and zero in our enhanced portfolio allocator, only 20% in our growth program, and an absolute return, which actually doesn't look at the direction of the market, um, has only a 20% exposure. We can be in a bullish mode like we were for most of 2010 and, and the second half of 2009. We could be more in a transition mode um, like we were in June and July of this year. Or we could be in bearish mode. And as you can see right now, we are in bearish mode. We showed you the charts that show we're probably in a bear market. We're going to see big rallies in the market, but we're also probably going to see a lot more declines. You can see from this chart for income allocators, the, if you focus on the, the right-hand side, that red circle, which is the point we sold the high-yield bond exposure, the market did start to sell off, but it's kind of been churning since then. So people are probably saying, well, why, are, why am I sitting in money market? Why am I not making much money? Well, it's because besides the treasury bond market, all the other bonds are just kind of chopping around, trying to see what's going to happen out of Europe and here in the United States. So we have gotten defensive in income allocator, but we also think there's opportunities that are being created, especially if we see a bit, another big downdra downdraft in the high yield market. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to make money there. Finally, we mentioned absolute return allocator, and I want to talk about this again because in a choppy market like this, an absolute return strategy really comes in handy because absolute return does not look at the direction of the price in the stock market. It looks at the direction that institutions are putting money into the stock market. So if we're at a point where institutions are putting more money in at a time like maybe the middle of the month when the, everybody's 401k investments start hitting the stock market, absolute return allocator is trying to be invested in the market during those times. And then to scale back that exposure at times where money might be coming out of, of the stock market. Think of times like your, when the quarterly business taxes are due. Um, a lot of money comes out of the market. But you can see if you focus on the dark blue line versus the light blue line, absolute return has added a lot of value to, to people's portfolios. But I do want to remind people, it is not a smooth ride because it is what we call a long, short strategy. It's, it's going to have a position in funds that go up when the market goes up, but it's also going to have an offsetting position in funds that go down if the market goes up. But you can see from some of those tough periods there, most recently what I called the twist and shout, which is last week when the Fed announced Operation Twist, market lost 6.5%. Absolute return actually made money. That's why we include it in somebody's portfolio. The reason we don't put 100% in the, that portfolio, as you can see over on the left, the worst day was actually a 2% loss for absolute return. Of course, the S&P lost 6.7% in just one day. And again, the negative correlation there means it does not track what the stock market is doing. We've covered an awful lot today. Um, most of this information is also available on our website. It's a free registration if you want to get some of the data. If you're an individual investor, you just go to our website, stratequity.com. You click there where it says investors, you fill out a couple questions, you'll get an email, always check your spam filter, and from there, confirm that it is indeed a legitimate email address, log back into our website, and then you could check out some of the things that we have. If you're a professional investment advisor, follow the same steps except click that professional button, you'll have a, a few more tools available to you, including paperwork and things like that that can help you open more accounts with us. And it's there as a tool, whether you're an in individual or a professional, that site is there to update you on what's going on and, and everything else. So I hope you have found today's call informational and, and helpful to you. Um, give us some feedback. You can click the contact us form on, on the website. My email address is um, also included on there. 
just let us know if this is something you want to see us do, how often you want to see us do it. Give us the feedback, and, and we'll see if we can do something like this again. Again, thanks for joining us, and hope you have a great rest of the day.